Oh, thank you very much, Rian. Uh, absolute pleasure and an honor to be here. So uh, one of the things I really appreciate uh, about Peter um, would be his heart uh, to serve. And uh, also a second thing, um, you know, the eagerness to, le to learn. And uh, he's one of those lifelong continuous learners. Uh, as we were sitting during lunch, uh, he was just telling me, of courses he's currently attending and uh, you know the one in particular there's a commitment of every week one evening and uh, he thought he knew certain things you know about certain topics but then oh there's more to learn and uh, you know I really appreciate that so uh, this afternoon I trust that all of us will also learn uh, from practical examples you know uh, out of his life so uh, as you know as is custom at LifeWork, we invite a business leader and uh, we have a case study interview. So today our topic is compassion. But before we get to that, maybe Peter, you can look back a few years ago in recent history, uh, you know, maybe the first 25 years or so of your life. Uh, tell us a little bit about your childhood. <laughs> He's such a diplomat, this guy, you know, so uh, just recently. Uh, uh -huh. So as you can see, uh, I'm still old school, uh, no <laughs> tablet here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, recently, I suppose, uh, up till the age of 25, uh, I really had to go and sit and think about that uh, from some time ago. But nevertheless, um, I'm one, I'm the second of five children and um, the seventh generation name, believe it or not. So, Peter Hendrik the seventh, Kutsia. <laughs> um, I was fortunate enough in my younger life to attend only two primary and only two secondary schools in three towns called Orkney, Clarksdorp and Potterstrom for those Northwesterners or in the old days the Western Transvaalers. Shout a hurrah. Orkney Snorkney, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, uh, so many like that. It wasn't me though. <laughs> My wife would feel different about that anyway. So, um, as growing up as a child, um, we had to work on the farms on, uh, on holidays. So, I was fortunate enough to milk a cow and plow the land and plant and things like that. But uh, also fortunate enough to to still play cowboys and crooks on horseback. I kid you not, we were to shoot each other with uh, air rifles and uh, were really, really good cowboys and cops at the time. I matriculated in 1976 at the, um, uh, I was aged 16 in matric and my father said there's a shortage of uh, teachers at the time, so I attended the Potsdam University for Christian higher education then in Potsdam, studying uh, teaching, but I did, I think I held um, provincial colours in about seven or eight sports at the time, um, including Transvaal colours for trampoline, haha. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, and uh, needless for me to say, I didn't do any academics, so two years later, <laughs> I, I was sent to, to the military, aged 18, and uh, probably the best thing in my life because it gave me some direction. Um, and as I came back in 1982, I studied civil engineering in uh, Pretoria. Hmm. I know you're a proud family man, so um, we'll allow you the opportunity to boast uh, about your family a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, um, I see you got 20 minutes for that, yeah? Thank you very much. <laughs> I married um, a, a girl seven years younger than me at the age of 31 only, uh, and it was only due to all my mother's prayers. So for the first 25 years... Sorry, she, uh, did your yeah, mom pray yeah. that you won't get married or that you would? Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I was just going to explain. The first <laughs> 25 years, she uh, had prayed for me that I never get married. I'm just too naughty. And then from there onwards, uh, for the next six or seven years, she had prayed for me that at least I'd get a chance in life. So, um, so nevertheless, Brenda is today a successful um, real estate agent. Um, we have two children. Our boy is 26. Oh, by the way, Ruan, next year is a big one for us because we will be married 30 years. A rocky road, I tell you not, for those of you still on your way there. Oh, goodness, difficult. 
<laughs> but all worth it. Uh, our son is a chartered accountant, studied at uh, Stellenbosch. Um, he resides there now, he lives there. And um, our daughter is in her final year as we speak uh, for, with occupational therapy in Bloemfontein. So hopefully next year she can come and do a hospital year in, in Pretoria. Um, I would want to tell you an interesting story about Peter Hendrik Kutsia VIII. My wife said uh, when she woke up in the hospital when he was born, uh, he was already registered. Uh, true, maybe. Nevertheless, so I gave Peter all sorts of instructions going to university and things like that in his first year saying, look, you must be balanced. You must try everything but retain the best. So in your first year, if you have, if you pause any, if you, if you fail any subject, you come home. If you pass any subjects with more than 55%, you didn't balance, you're going home either. <laughs> so he had a very good strategy. He got uh, what do you call a re-examination. Yeah, yeah, a re-examination. He had about four of those. So then, of course, they only mark till 50 and you pass. <laughs> no, I'm joking. And then in his second year, I said to him, you better look and find a goal, which he did. So... And I said, you're only going to find her in one place, and that's in church. So one Sunday, he walks up to this girl. He's seen her there a couple of times, believe me. So he gears up enough courage, and he walks over, and he says, Hello, I've been looking at you for some time. I'm so eager to meet you. My name is Peter. And she bursts out laughing. And he says, oh, what's so funny? He's like sort of taken aback a little bit. She says, you won't believe it. My brother's name is Peter. And he enjoys it and he laughs with her. And she says, oh, by the way, um, what's your name? And she says, my name is Nadia. And he cracked himself. Guess what? His sister's name is Nadia. <laughs> and they had a good laugh about it. Good thing is today, Ruan, I am father of two Nadia Kutsias. How wonderful is that? So uh, you are the managing director of Self-Track. Um, tell us a little bit about this company um, which you lead and uh, what is it you guys do exactly and uh, how big is your team? Oh, thank you, Ruan. Um, Self-Track, um, I conceptualized that name um, about 14 years ago when I wanted to, to disrupt the tracking environment and said that technology has grown so much you should be able to track yourself, manage yourself, um, configure or set up the driving behavior of something you use yourself. So this whole philosophy of self-manage and track was born. Um, it's an international group and since then we've grown the family to at least seven divisions, meaning self-track, which is all related to GPS tracking of vehicles, people, assets, Self-fleet, which is all about fleet management, um, doing driver scoring, uh, doing uh, uh, a, a monitoring of your fuel tires and things like that, F complete fuel and fleet management. Also self-cam, which is a live camera streaming technology, again in the fleet environment or logistics environment. Another division is self-route, where we do optimized uh, routing and scheduling to again assist the fleet owner. And also, we had developed a platform called Self-Help, which is a personalized emergency assistance um, mobile application. And then recently, we've added Self-Rent, which is an asset financing component, and also Self-Insure, again, to assist the fleet owners um, so that they can do insurance. The team, and we're currently busy rolling out approximately 12 licenses across uh, South Africa. But the team uh, serves, um, you know, uh, a workforce in excess of 650 people that, uh, that varies from executive management level straight down to installation technicians and also the guys with the short hair and the bulletproof vests, the, uh, the armed recovery force agents. So uh, I know some time ago there was a significant uh, encounter you had. So um, when did Jesus become a reality to you? 
Yeah, so you must have heard I've been hit a lot when I was a small uh, boy. Um, um, so I grew up Christian. Um, I was also a deacon in the, in the Dutch Reformed Church at some stage, simply because my mum said so, I suppose. Uh, it was nice to be in that environment as well. But never really, I suppose, grasped the, uh, um, the value of it all as a, as a person. So um, God has got such a sense of humor. He gave me kids, and that taught me a lot more than I had ever learned before. So it was around 20, 2010 when, um, when my son got home one night and said they were at Sunday school preparing for um, inauguration into the church and things like that. And I asked, so what did you learn? And um, he said, no, not really. There, weren't, there was nobody there. So we just chatted about what the guys did last night and things like that. So we became really concerned and started looking around and asking around. And we didn't get any answers. So we started church searching. So we eventually found a church which we loved. We loved the, uh, the whole idea of, uh, of city changing and everything that's connected with it. It was quite a change for us. Um, but uh, a year later, we got baptized um, and we adopted the church in total and became so involved that we had attended just about every course that, uh, that, uh, that was offered. And in attending those courses, became involved so that we can stay on as facilitators and, and help um, to take that course further, to get more people involved. So um, that, of course, also because of our involvement in the church, uh, it elevated us to a place where we could start a small cell group, a family cell group. It started off with two people, and eventually we ended up with six families all together in that. Um, we did that for a couple of years, and then I started getting involved in uh, area facilitation so that we can plant more cell groups and things like that. Um, I think you've mentioned I did one of the, f I was a pilot, and one of the first, in the, in the very first leader, life work leadership, it was held in 2014, um, and I wanted to be involved in facilitating with that later as well. I did the, uh, the full brink cases, the not do but done. Uh, course. I facilitated that for a couple of years. So when people ask me how I get involved and how I stay involved in these things, I, I usually say that uh, I do, however, keep an electronic diary, by the way. Um, and whenever there's empty space in my diary, my, my PA uh, must know that that's kept open because uh, I fill it with God's work. Everything that's open, I just fill it with God's work and I keep it involved. And I, I try to be involved in the church and the people around it because that keeps me um, sane, I suppose. Now, on the, on the topic of compassion, um, can I ask you uh, your definition of compassion? Um, what does it mean to you? And uh, then we'll discuss maybe a few of the examples of, of um, organizations and places uh, you got involved with. Oh, yeah, I thought you were going to ask me easy questions. You know, that's... Um, and I've, I mean, you've obviously looked up the definition, and there's so many definitions of compassion, but it's, um, I still sit here today, and I think I'm compassionate. And I think whatever I can do is compassion. And if I think that I tell you the definition for me now is to be as good to others as you can possibly be, I still sit here today and think, whatever I'm doing is just way too short. Man, I can do more. I can do definitely more. So um, my definition of compassion, I suppose, is to do as best as you can, but to be the beginning. Let that be the beginning of what you can still do. So um, having said that, perhaps um, um, one of the reasons maybe why you invited me to talk about compassion is I sat in this very hall many years ago, and I'm not sure if um, Francois van Niekerk is still part of the process or he has been already this year or not, are they? You will meet him later. This young man, which is about 10 years older than me or maybe more, inspired me a couple of years ago, probably five or six years ago already, in a message of uh, what I thought was, uh, was absolutely great. 
So what that is, is that he said that he reached the point in his life where he had to hand over a part of his business to, to God. Um, it inspired me, so I had started a journey, and today I can share with you that I had uh, transferred, well, let me first say, um, because I wanted to God to be part of my life, real life, and real business, I said the only way in which I can do that is to also give God more than half of the business that I own. So we created a trust that we named Tehila. Tehila is the Hebrew name for praise and worship. So we transferred more than half of the shares of the company into that trust. And that trust, we then went on an extensive search for beneficiaries that would be part of that trust, which is God's work. We wanted to have an enterprise type of, uh, um, of beneficiary. We also, our hearts also led us to, to uh, women, and, uh, and then we also looked for somebody that is small um, and really in need of assistance. So after probably about 18 months, or 24 months even, we had selected three beneficiaries. The, the first one is Pop-Up. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we are so excited that, uh, that Pop-Up is part of our business in, many, in much more than one way. Um, so secondly, we also adopted a company called Women Against Rape. And we support her, Jolene, in, in, in the things that she, that she does. And then a young girl that studied in Pretoria um, as BSc Geology. She had finished her studies at Tux and couldn't find a job. And then she started doing community work. And after that, she uh, was asked to come and help at the local school. Um, out in Kwamschlangu, it's about uh, an hour and a half's drive out of town. And then um, she started tutoring math classes because uh, the pass rate was something like 18%. So when we came to her and we realized the absolute need that she was experiencing, we adopted her as a beneficiary as well and included her in the company. So um, these three beneficiaries, we, uh, we serve them with, we, well, we assist them with servant leadership we provide them with uh, Christian business principles as far as we can, and uh, uh, not to mention uh, with resources that they require. I think that's applaudable. <laughs> so um, I know the, the group Peter was uh, in that very first year, um, they formed such close friendships, and uh, I think each and every person in that group actually underwent a significant change that year, you know, either in their personal uh, or in their business lives. And um, if I'm not mistaken, you guys still meet actually on a regular basis and uh, speak into each other's lives. So um, I, I remember part of the journey um, that very first year when uh, you had to make a few of those tough uh, decisions. And uh, I just want to applaud you for... Uh, you know, sticking to what you believe uh, God told you to do and um, the new direction the business, you know, is in going in. Um, in, in the South African context, uh, speaking of CSI or um, CSR, uh, most of us are involved in typical Mandela Day initiatives. So uh, that's where we pick uh, a charity of our choice and uh, we normally go and paint something and the poor people at the nonprofit have to get professional painters in afterwards to fix our mess. Um, I mean, this is uh, honestly speaking. So if anyone wants to come and paint uh, Papa's uh, boardroom or so on, um, thank you, but no thank you. Um, on their behalf, um, rather give us the check, uh, just to echo what uh, you know, Jason was saying. I'm joking, of course, Mandela Day initiatives you know, it's important and it's, it's fun and, you know, uh, we can soothe our conscience at least once a year because um, you feel good about what you did that day. But uh, 
the question I'm asking is, is it really sustainable? So, um, you know, can you maybe give us an example or a way? How do you think can we as business people in the room get involved with non-profit organizations and partner in a sustainable manner? Well, if you were asking, well, first of all, Ruan, before we go any further, um, thank you very much for the applaud, but may I just say I seek no glory for myself whatsoever. In fact, I feel the grace of God for being able to have done this, and I seek that you keep praying for us that we will deliver his work, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't, I didn't bring any names if that was what you was asked, what you were asking, but but I thought a lot about how, what sort of wisdom, what sort of advice, or what sort of pointers could I give you in terms of how to, uh, to do something for others in a sustainable uh, manner. And I came up with uh, basically three concepts. And the first one is that you should be involved in mentorship. Now, in mentorship has at least three levels, if you think three-dimensional. Because we, you and I, I hope you each have a mentor. If it's your mum, if it's your dad, if it's your pastor, please, if you don't have a mentor, find one. You must surround yourself with friends who have mentors so that you can have mentor friends so as to discuss similar things. And please, offer your services to mentees. Um, I like to, uh, to sew back into young people's lives and things like that. So each of those three levels of mentorship should be part of your lives. And then I want to uh, ask you to also increase your capacity for others. You should value people every day. You should be more valuable to others. You should put yourself often in somebody else's shoes. You should focus on giving rather than getting. Be consistent in that what you do. Make memories for others. And last, uh, move towards the kind of relationship that you desire for yourself. And Jason, thank you also so much for that message on relationship because I want to say something about that as well. Develop your relationships. Um, our relationships with others is just a pure reflection of our relationship with God. Isn't that true? So I want to give you this scripture from Hebrew 10. Um, verse 24 to 25, it comes from the Amplified. It says, let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction, as is the habit of, same, of some, but encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. May that inspire you to be compassionate. And then, last but not least, perhaps also uh, some advice that, uh, that I've experienced. I've made two notes here. One is that uh, you shouldn't be giving anything away for free. For free means it's got mm, little value, or if it has any value, it's not going to last long. I want to share two examples with you in giving something for free. Um, this one of these beneficiaries um, required a fridge in a house because the, the fridge that they had backed up. And my wife Brenda had just received, uh, she sold somebody's house who moved overseas and uh, a fridge was staying over in that house. And uh, she sold the house and then the lady who sold the house said, well, please just take everything out there. So now she's got a, a fridge and um, it's in the stall, it's taken out of the house, and now uh, this person in Kwamhlangu, in, in, in Pumalanga, uh, who doesn't have a fridge in a house, um, I take the fridge on a bucky and I go and deliver it there, and she says, thank you very much, and so on. And then I said, uh, you owe me 800 rand. Hmm. Is nobody going to throw me with something? <laughs> Remember, I got it for free. So then I said, um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a Bosch, and it was a 20,000 rand fridge, by the way. And I said to her, make me a price, whatever. I didn't ask her for the money. I just said, make me a price. And she suggested 800 rand, and I said, that's fine. 
So she paid 800 rand and she got a fridge. She will look after that fridge as if she paid 20,000 rand for it. Believe me. So I took the fridge that didn't work. I took the 800 rand and I fixed that fridge. And I gave it to somebody else. Who also doesn't have a fridge. So um, the value that you find in something must not be for free. They must work for it. So in the same way... Um, this teacher that I told you, she gives maths to, uh, to some grade three to, to seven uh, school children. So I said to her, I'll give you all the stationery you need and everything else, whatever the case may be, but you cannot tutor for free. So I don't mind, I don't care if you ask 10 rand or 100 rand per kid or whatever the case may be, but your students cannot be tutored for free. Again, she values what she has delivered, um, and now the parents pay, I think, 10 rand per month, but you know what? That buys a bread for 12 o'clock lunch or something like that, and they have a lot more value to it. So maybe a long story, but don't give something away for free. I like that. Some... Uh Practical advice, um, yeah, there for us. Um, money is needed, um, obviously, uh, and the need is immense uh, all over. Uh, but I want to challenge you in the room to, to start thinking, you know, look at what you have uh, in your hands and, uh, you know, what you have received. And maybe um, it's monetary and, you know, maybe you can uh, bless others uh, financially, but maybe there's certain skills um, that you have or that even within your organization, which might be what a non-profit organization is needing within our city. Because the goal is to transform the city um, uh, into a place where, where God can reign and where His kingdom you know, can, be, can be established. So, uh, Go and think about this. Go back to the drawing board or your boardroom and think of ways, you know, and maybe it's like in Peter's case where you have to restructure, you know, s the way uh, you do things. Um, but maybe it's volunteering, um, you know, certain things. If I can uh, brag a little bit about uh, what we did at Biggin, um, we, we are encouraging um, all our employees to spend a minimum of four hours per month in a non-profit environment. So during office hours, um, uh, we pay for that, but uh, so they come and taking your grandmother shopping or you know going to have your own nails or hair done does not count. Um, so th uh, our staff need to come with certain um, proposals and then we approve. Uh, along with, you know, uh, executive management, yes, these are, um, you know, the, the types of non-profit environments um, that we want to be involved with. And because we employ a lot of technical people as well, civil engineers, and, 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 sometimes it is technical skills which we, uh, you know, contribute uh, and on a pro bono basis. But other times it's going and helping young school kids, primary school kids with their homework. Um, in less fortunate areas. Um, on a regular basis, we found the sustainability for us was not that once a year hit and run approach, but building relationships and asking questions. And I'm happy to say that all of us um, always feel more blessed than the beneficiaries. Um, and we learn way more from them uh, than what we might uh, go and try and teach or, you know, share uh, skills with. Peter, tell us about a certain dilemma, um, you know, uh, a situation, uh, and before you're going to give us, you know, the solution or the answer to this, we're going to turn back to the class and we're going to ask them to, to tell us what they would have done in your shoes. Um, what was that tricky dilemma? Uh, well, I don't have any uh, rocket scientist problems for you, but I kept it easy for you today. So I'll, I'll sketch a situation in which we were recently, and then I'd love your ideas on that. So 
after the fridge and all the work we're doing there. I'm strolling through the streets of Alaman's Drift Sea in Kwamshangu, and uh, I meet up with a couple boys there, and uh, they just sit around chatting. So I start talking to the guy, and uh, this one guy, um, Tabu Mdaka, he's 18 years old. He finished matric in 2017, uh, and this was in January of this year, by the way. So um, I ask him, so what are you doing? He says, no, nothing. Uh, they don't have anything to do. So I say, uh, you don't work anywhere? Don't, you, what do you mean you have nothing to do? He says, no, we have nothing to do. We sit here. I say, all day? He says, yes. I say, every day? He says, yes. Um, so I, we have a chat. We talk about things, and he tells me more. From time to time, he would go and do a bit of community work um, at, a con at a community center not too far from his house. Um, but he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke. Um, they just basically sit there and do nothing. And I ask him about what he wants to do and things like that. And he's got all these dreams and he's working on them, but he's got nobody to direct him to that. So... Uh, we chat away and eventually he says, no, I like your car. I say, well, let's go for a spin. I take him to the shop. We buy some Coke and chocolates and whatever the case may be. And he says, oh, this is really a nice car. Uh, he'd love to work on a car like this. And if he could, he'd be an engineer. Oh, man, my heart just broke. What did you You've met Tabu, 18-year-old, uh, unemployed, uh, we assume no resources to go and study, um, and this is a situation all too familiar with us. We have probably face or drive past lots of Tabus every day, youngsters um, that seem to not have hope or a future millions and millions of young people within our nation. Now, what do you do for this one? Let's take a few minutes and just come up with a few creative ideas around the table. Okay, I, uh, are we ready to hear how the Lord led uh, Peter and his family to act uh, in this specific situation? Yeah. He will also need a microphone, uh, yeah, thank you, and uh, yeah, wonderful ideas from everybody here. Yeah? Um, and may I just commend you all, because everything that you did is better than not doing anything at all. So thank you very much for that. We, of course, went home. Um, I have some friends. I phoned up a friend, and I said, he's got a, well, Tabu did say he liked to work on cars it's, uh, and things like that. So I phoned this friend, and I say, um, would you like to take a new apprentice mechanic? He says, well, I don't really have the place. And so I say, um, first of all, you don't have to pay him anything. Um, I'll pay for him. He says, oh, well, I can use somebody to wash the cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, then I said to him, but he stays in Pumalanga. It's an hour and a half's drive by car. That's your and my car. If they have to travel by taxi, by bus, it's a two and a half, almost three hour drive. Which means you have to leave at three o'clock in the morning. That's not on. So the Lord then directed me, I kid you not, a block away from Hansi is uh, in Fairy Glen. Um, it's an old woman, Tani. It's an old uncle and aunt. Sorry. And uh, they run a guest house. It's a guest house for the needy people. So it's literally a string of rooms with electricity, but the room is hardly three by three meters and with central ablution facilities. But it's dirt cheap and it's perfect. So I then um, appointed Tabu in my company as an uh, internship with a very, very small and basic salary. I have him start at this motor clinic as an intern mechanic, hoping that I could train him better in the longer term to become a mobile 
installation technician on our business, etc., etc. So there's a future for him. And I tell him that so he knows he's working towards a bigger goal. So then he stays in this little room, uh, he pays his rent, uh, and he's got a couple bucks left to buy bread. We provide him with protein in the, in the, f in the form of eggs and whatever the case may be. But uh, he eats well, he lives well, he stays well, he works well. And I say to Hansi, um, please teach him, pass the spanners, wash the cars. Uh, he wants to be an engineer, so tell him to put the engine there and there and there and whatever. I'm just joking. <laughs> That's a bad joke. I'm sorry. Um, we will get him there, trust me. So I said that the condition is that um, you must teach him honor, respect, value, punctuality. Um, you must teach him concern for things, you must teach him integrity, uh, generosity, all the things that you're doing in this course, I tell him to teach him that, and of course, compassion, teach him that. So he must learn that in his work. So um, it's wonderful, um, I, I see him regularly, because I said to him, part of your salary is to come and work at my house on Saturdays. Uh, to follow further up on his apprenticeship. Um, and there's a reason for that. Remember, nothing gets for free. I want him to make an effort to get up on a Saturday to come and work with me. When he comes to me, by the way, he sits in the house for most of the day and he can't believe he's got such unlimited data for his cell phone. <laughs> he downloads music and he goes absolutely crazy. And of course, we love having him around. And of course, Brenda feeds him to pieces. But he looks like an arky, that, what, no, stroik, what, what do you call that? Um, he, uh, he loves being there. So nevertheless, and it's a time for us to minister to him. And to also teach him those things that I've mentioned before. Um, so I ask him, um, so when are you going home? Uh, you you want to go home weekends? He says, no, 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 I'm fine, I'll go in December. So he's absolutely loving it. Um, and I tell you, um, what he enjoys most is the attention and also the, uh, what is menswaardigheid? Menswaardigheid. Dignity. Thank you very much. So I pick him up two weeks ago, Saturday morning. I get to the guest house where he stays. He's not there, and the owner there tells me, he's just up the road there on the corner of Atterbury and, uh, don't worry, um, with the informal traders where they sell cigarettes and things. I think, you bugger, you, get, you started smoking, I am going to kill you. So I'm racing up there to try and find him, and uh, as I come there, um, you may not know this, or may or may not know this, but when you approach some of the informal traders on the corner of a the street, there's about 40 other people sitting there, casual day laborers, and if you drive slowly and you look around, they all think you're looking for them to come and work at your place. So naturally, we've got 50 people attacking my car. And guess what Tabu does? He gets up and he says, sorry guys. <laughs> Walks over to the door, opens it up, and gets in. I don't have to tell you uh, what happened there after. Nevertheless, he loved being there, um, and he loves his new job. And uh, he tells me he can already take an engine out, he can clean it and wash it, and if Mr. Hansi has fixed it, he can help him put it back. I think that deserves a round of applause, even though Peter doesn't want it. Um, it's amazing. So um, the question is, who is the taboo that uh, God wants you to meet and to reach out to, and uh, in what way? So um, know that he's coming or she's coming and uh, it might be more than one. And what I want to encourage you with is um, how often do we feel overwhelmed 
by the uh, size of of this problem um, that we just don't start or just don't do anything at all. And there's that um, cliche story of the guy on the beach throwing back the starfish that uh, got into trouble there on the beach and someone walked up and said, but what are you doing? And he said, no, I'm picking up starfish and I'm throwing it back. And he said, but there's like hundreds or thousands. What? It doesn't really mean anything. And he said, well, for this one, it does make a difference. And threw it back. So. Uh, Who's that one person uh, you can be used to, to change his or her life? Um, maybe, uh, you know, seeing that we just came out of uh, elections and uh, automatically not all our problems were just solved overnight. Um, we are in South Africa, we are in the African continent, and we face, well, globally, we face challenges. Um, we're mainly business people in the room. Do you have advice? for us or, you know, motivation, uh, should we stay here, should we all, um, you know, put in our applications to immigrate uh, somewhere colder, uh, or, or did God perhaps intend for us to be here? We're going to Texas, so we're going to stay with Jason. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere, I'm staying right here and I'm loving it. Um, and yeah, for sure. Um, I, I wanted to share something with you that I read this morning. Um, you know uh, John, Dr. John Maxwell very well. Um, and this is about positive thinking. So thank you very much for that because that's one of the first things I would say is that we should all uh, um, exercise positive thinking. John writes it like this. He says, the people who see God's hand at work most in their life are the people who look for God's hand at work. They live expectantly, believing that he is interested and involved in the day-to-day -day matters of humanity. People who don't often see God's hand at work tend to think of him as distant or disconnected. And because of this, they don't expect to see much in the way of his power. It's why the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about all such things. Guys, just let's just be positive. And then my 10-point plan for effective leaders. I'm just going to rush through these 10 points, but I love them. Have a clear vision, guys. Um, embrace change. Have passion. Live with passion. Do your business with passion. Have integrity. Be humble. Develop your people. Be accessible. Give credit. Be servant. Serve you. Serve. And, of course, have a higher purpose. I like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, maybe uh, any final thoughts? Um, anything the Lord... Uh, might have yeah, in your heart. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to thank you, Ron, for the opportunity also. Perhaps it's just as a final note. At first I thought I'd talk a little bit about it, and then I got I, I uh, decided on the message that, that you gave on this topic of compassion as well. I'm going to repeat it in a while, but I want to bring back my original idea and what I wanted to share with you. And that is that we serve a triune God. God Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just like we, you and me, are triune in body, soul, in spirit. So exercise each of the elements of your body, soul, and spirit to be alive and to live forward and to be and to live in the realistic realm of internal, external and eternal reality. And then I couldn't other, but then just again say the words of Teresa of Avila. Um, namely that God is nobody on earth but yours. Um, no hands, no feet but yours. You are the eyes through which Christ's compassion look out to the world. And you are the feet, the feet in which he is going to go and do good. And you are the hands 
with, he, with, he, with whom he is going to bless now. And may I ask you all to just stretch out your hands and with the power of Jesus, you can show it here to pop up and say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bless pop up. Thank you very much. We are